Hello, China. This is the United States, and in fact, this is Los Angeles on this side of the Pacific Ocean, one of the many things that divides China from the United States. Uh, but I've been invited to talk a little bit about U.S.-China relations, and I thought maybe the best way to discuss it with you is to discuss it with you as I would discuss it with my own students here at Loyola Marymount University, where I am the professor of uh, and distinguished scholar, don't forget that, of Asian and Pacific studies. And, uh, and I teach classes on uh, China. I teach classes on the relationship between America and Asia in general. Uh, it's a complicated but very important uh, topic. As you know, uh, Asia is now the center of the economic and political world uh, through its enormous growth in the second half of the 20th century. So what I do for my students to simplify it, because I don't want to make it boring, is to offer 10 do nots, or you might say the 10 commandments of U.S.-China relations, and that way I find them easier to remember and so do my students. I hope this works for you as well as it does for them. And I invite you to come to Loyola Marymount and visit us sometime and we'll show you how we operate. First do not is based on the fact that China has 1.4 billion people. This is a big number. I always say to my students and I always say to my fellow professors, if you want to understand China, do not underestimate 1.4 billion. That's a big number. That's a big job. That's four times as many people as J Donald Trump has to worry about. It is huge. Do not. That's the first do not. Forget 1.4 billion people. Commandment number two, another do not. Do not forget about China's particular history. 5,000 years, we have 240, 250 years, whatever, but a deep culture of the Han culture, the Chinese culture, the Confucian culture, all of these things that are deeply rooted in China uh, are going to affect the way China looks at itself and the way it looks at the world. And it's our job as Americans to try to understand uh, China, just as it's your job to try to understand the United States better. Number three, commandment number three, is based on China's, uh, in general, difficult relations with outside powers and the fact that outside powers have taken advantage of China whenever really it was possible to do so. So my third do not is do not underestimate the paranoia that China has is not only about the United States, but perhaps certainly the United States and other outside powers as to what they're really about, what they really want to do with China. Can they really be thought of as friends or allies? That's a difficult hurdle to get over. It's a hurdle of, of mistrust and distrust. And, uh, and I always say that's the third commandment. Do not underestimate the fact that there's a lot of bad blood and a lot of bad history. Can be overcome, but not if you underestimate it. Whatever you want to say about China's government, and this is the do not number four, whatever you want to say about China's government, uh, um, you know, you're anti-communist or you're pro-communist or, or whatever, keep in mind that this government, this party, one party system has raised more people out of poverty than as far as anyone knows any other government in the history of recorded time. This is some achievement. This cannot be ignored. This cannot be explained away. This is not an advocacy for the Chinese one party system. But on the other hand, do not forget to mention that this economic miracle is, was, uh, occurred while the Chinese party was in power. The fifth commandment in China-U.S. relations is another do not, and that is I would advise Americans, do not try to explain to the world the superiority of a two-party political system over a one-party political system. There may be an argument for that, uh, but this is not really a great time in America's history to try and make the argument that America's political party system, which is basically two, two parties, is uh, functioning uh, better than your one party system. All party systems have their flaws and downsides, all have their upsides, comparative advantages, comparative disadvantages. But right now it's very hard to say that one is clearly better than the other.
Commandment number six. Whenever someone in America says that the Chinese have a wrong view of us, I'm tempted to reply, well, we have a wrong view of them. Uh, neither of our medias has done an exceptional job of giving uh, the public's the, the kind of picture that we need for the 21st and 22nd century. Uh, but and, and I would even say that perhaps the controlled media of China has done actually a slightly better job of uh, giving a picture of uh, the American media due to the way the American media works. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a huge advantage, but I would, I, I would not say you can make the argument that the American media has done a better job than the Chinese media of informing its people as to the true nature of the other. I know some of you are very worried about our uh, President uh, Donald Trump, and uh, you're not the only ones. There's a lot of people in America that are worried, too. Uh, he tends to shoot from the hip and, and say a lot of things. He said a lot of unpleasant, negative things about China during the campaign when he, was, uh, he won his surprise election over Hillary Clinton. And, uh, but as he gets, uh, moves along through uh, his weeks and months as president, he will come up to the reality of China as something that you have to work with you can't work against it. You can't work around it. It's a reality of our life. And uh, you, of course, you never know what Donald Trump's going to do. But I would have to say that the probability is he's going to more or less come out to pretty much where many of the other presidents came out policy-wise. I wouldn't get too concerned. He says crazy things about everybody. Uh, he doesn't pick China out. Uh, I would say stay relatively relaxed about that. The next do not is do not overreact when you see headlines or uh, television uh, announces talking about a trade war between China and the United States. First of all, China and the United States cannot afford a trade war. Both sides know it. Secondly, the interrelationship between the two economies now is so extensive, it's much like Japan was in the, in the 80s, that while the politicians may talk about a trade war and may t talk tough, the fact of the matter is, is that China and the U.S. are really uh, you know, in, in this whole thing together, and there's no way of them uh, pulling apart from the relationship. So I would just be calm about that. That one, I think, is not going to be a major issue. I really don't. You don't know with Trump, but I think if you look at the reality of the relationship, I think you'll see peace and prosperity is what everybody wants, and the best way that can happen is through co economic cooperation. Do not number nine concerns copyright catfights. This is when the United States claims that its goods, its uh, patents, its inventions are being stolen and uh, ripped off in China and so on and so forth. Th this is a serious issue. I think this one's going to be a problem. It's certainly already been a problem with Hollywood. It's been a problem with record distributors. And as you know, many of those uh, uh, huge firms are headquartered here or have major offices here in Los Angeles. So it's a big issue. And I think it will be a source of friction between the United States and China. Not enough to go, over, go to war over, but I think the two cultures look at the issue of copyright differently from the other. We're a culture of innovation. You're a culture of history. And you, you have invented all kinds of things for which you don't have a copyright. Um, and we look at it differently. So I don't know how that will be worked out. It has to be worked out, but it will be difficult. The last do not is, is uh, don't get too uh, upset over the currency manipulation charge that the U.S. throws at China a lot. There was some truth to it 10, 15 years ago, but as China's economy has become more and more integrated with the world economy as a result of entrance of the World Trade Organization, the inspired decision by Zhu Ranji and, and uh, Jiang Zemin's government, uh, which was the right thing for China to do despite the pain. Since then, China has been moving more towards a market-based currency. It's still not there yet, but it's, but it's done much better. And in fact, it's gotten to the point now where even a politician like Trump really can't complain too much about uh, currency manipulation. So do not worry about the currency manipulation issue. It's an old issue. There are more important ones coming up. If there's one illustration one explanation, one example, one metaphor 
that I think explains what's happening in world politics today with China and the U.S. now in this kind of situation. It's uh, called the, the metaphor of the two sons. And I want to see if it works as well for you as it does for me, my students, and the staff members of Asia Media. By the way, we publish this Asia Media at LMU every day. It comes out with new stories and so forth. You should take a look at it. Anyway, here's the theory of the, of the two, two sons. At the end of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union fell, there was only one superpower son in the universe. That was the United States. All the planets, right, all the countries, right, revolved one way or another around the U.S. Some might have gotten too close, some may have been too far away, but they all had their orbits around this one sun, and they managed to do it without bumping into one another, uh, and, and, and it took a, a bit of adjustment, but it wasn't too hard because it was only one sun. But then, after a time, with the rise of China, with the modernization of China, with the economic growth of China, with the China reaching out, with China going into the World Trade Organization, with China taking a higher profile at the United Nations, there came into the geopolitical universe the second sun, S-U-N. Hot and big and important. Now, what do you do if you're one of these 195 or 196 planets, which are the rest of the other nations of the world? Do you just revolve around the new sun? Do you stick with just the old sun? Or do you try and do a figure eight and revolve around both suns? That's what most countries are trying to do now. They don't want to get too close to China, but they don't want to get too far away from China. They don't want to get too close to the U.S., but they don't want to get too far away. So a lot of countries are doing kind of a figure eight, and they're trying to figure out how to do the figure eight without bumping into one another or without getting too close and burning up to China or getting too close and burning up to the United States. So the metaphor of the two suns, if you think about it, is a brilliant way of imagining the geopolitical universe as a vast solar system, except there are two suns in the one solar system. And that's what makes the world different today. This is Tom Plate. I'm a distinguished scholar of Asia and Pacific Studies at Loyola Marymount University. I hope uh, this has been somewhat helpful, and I invite you to visit us in Los Angeles.